just going to jump in there and whether this is uh, controversial. Go for it. Um, I, I'm, I'm very anti, uh, you know, this is the way we should coach girls and this is the way we should coach boys. At the end of the day, we're trying to develop a person um, and we're, within that, it's a, we're trying to develop a player, a person, an athlete. So although our approach has changed based on, I guess, the environment or the culture that we're coaching in, and that's your culture is made up by the people within that environment. So if that tends to be boys, then you will adapt your coaching style, your language, your culture, the way you nurture uh, that particular person based on that environment and that culture rather than gender based. Um, and that's, you know, from the needs of that particular player in that time, that's what we are. Well, that's what we do as coaches is we try and, I guess, satisfy those needs and give them, I guess, the, the tools and the development or the empowerment to, to be better as people or be better as players or athletes. So for me, I'm really into this is how we should talk to girls or this is how I, you know, I coach boys. And Ace, you're right, it's not uh, copy and paste. Um, I know that I can speak to this player in this way and get, uh, I guess, a reaction or a change in behaviour that I need based on the culture, the environment, the relationship, the rapport that I've built with that player, regardless of gender. Yep. So I don't think, I mean, there might be certain things that might tailor your initial approaches, but I think that's always going to come down to the relationship that you've built with that player Mm -hmm. to be able to work with their needs and to be able to develop them in a, a positive environment. I think it's really like fair what you say, Kat. Um, I think it's really important as football, as a goal and as a sport, we have to move away from this whole gender, like, you know, boys and girls, men and women. The ideal world would be that we're all just footballers and, uh, you know, we are treated equally. Um, so I think that's definitely like somewhere that we want to get to because the reality is just not there at the moment, but I think it's definitely a goal that we all need to work towards. Yeah, and I think, look, and the reason is that we do keep having those conversations about women and football. Um, how different can, a, I guess, we set, we change mindsets about the way we, uh, we use our own language, we're differentiating, I guess, gender sport yes they're very unique and there does need to be silo approaches in terms of competitions and I guess regulate whatever it is in terms of the sport but um, I guess uh, holistically in the space of how we work with players is based on I guess you know so much of needs and uh, nurturing and getting the best out of a person uh, rather than you know this is a textbook on how to coach boys. Um, you know, where, where's the book to, you know, coaching, you know, it doesn't say how to develop male CEOs. You go through, you know, this is how you work through business and, you know, um, leadership and things like that. There's never any, this is how to be, become a male leader or a female leader. Um, it's the same in coaching where we're leading people. So there's always this reference to back to the person like, um, you know, the panel's already mentioned how important it is to, to, to look at the person first um, and then obviously develop them as an athlete and a player. And at no point have I said male or female, person, athlete, player. Yeah, I think um, Margot had a comment that she wanted to make. Yeah, um, I, I guess it's, 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 it's right. I agree with that. When I was saying what I've said before, it, I think that girls in a way need a safer environment than boys to um, to be who they really are, who they want to be and improve even more. Um, and I'm not saying that because girls are softer or whatever reason, it's psychologically that's a bit how they are. But if I want to give an example, um, I just read this article uh, on Sorry for the topic, but I find it's important okay. uh, on period and uh, how um, uh, coaches and so it was from the uh, World Cup in 2019, the uh, fitness coach from the national American national team uh, planned their fitness training around their period, girls mm -hmm. period and, and, and Chelsea is not now doing that. How many clubs in the world are doing that? Not that many. I've never had any doctors following me in these kind of things. And, and I know that's, 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 that can be an issue. What I'm saying is that 
when you have most of my life, I had men coaches. It's hard to go to a man and speak about that. Mm. Uh, I speak about it to your to, to your coach, and you have to and, and coaches have to under, to to understand how to deal with that and how to speak with their players. And when I say you need to adapt your communication, it's more in this way, in the way that you want the girls to feel comfortable with everything. And unfortunately, well, I don't know. I don't know the courses in Australia. The the the, the coaching the football co- co- courses, but I don't think that they're speaking about that. Yeah. And 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 so it's it's more about an understanding of the the needs of the girls. And that was an example, but you have different other examples. And just adapt, yeah, adapt your communication and the way you're doing things. Okay. Can I weigh in on this one? Uh, uh, Bianca is up next, and then Sam. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I'm kind of a little bit in the middle of what Kat's saying and, and what Margot is saying. I think they've both got valid points. I think we need to, we, yes, we do need to treat all players as athletes, whether they're male or female. You know, I've worked with all abilities. I've worked with uh, the deaf football, um, quite heavily involved with deaf football back in the day. Um, mm-hmm. And also male and females, I've, I've coached both. They've both got its pros and cons. But I think that, you know, when you're developing relationships with your players um, and as a leader to your players, it's important to be able to motivate them and or find what makes them tick or what makes them work. Some players do like that one-on-one. Some players like to be addressed in a group setting and not be pulled aside one-on-one. So, and I think that that's adaptable to all footballers or all athletes. You've got to know as a coach or as a TD or as a club, you need to be able to know um, that even though it's a team sport, you still need to know how to understand and adapt to the players as individuals. And I think that that's crucial. But also going into what Margot said, um, obviously Galaxy is doing a bit of research. I've been doing quite a bit of research into um, some publicity and, and some information that's come across scientifically with um, being injury prone or more prone to getting injuries during a menstrual cycle. So this is something that I'm looking at, you know, in when we tend to go back to football this year is something that I am looking at probably developing and bringing in and I think that you know it's important because I I do see this um, from a sports science background I do see that it could be a possible reason for you know some injuries happening or being more injury prone during that time so it's maybe something that we need to monitor but if you've got all male coaches coaching females it's probably not something that they're going to want to do so this is where maybe welfare officers and things like that Oh, it's I don't know. It, I, I don't know where, where the future of that's going to go, but it's definitely something that needs to be explored and, and tested in the waters here, definitely. Yeah. I, t- I probably want to jump back to Bianca okay. and, and given that you're starting to perhaps be a little bit of a trailblazer here in Victoria about doing that research around menstrual cycles and how we actually implement that at a level that we don't have exercise scientists, we don't have strength, well, some do, but, you know, we have the support of physios and strength conditioning coaches or, you know, sports scientists to to back up some of this, I guess, research um, or at least um, make sure that it's well known and we're providing clubs with that, that knowledge. And I think that's probably... The first part, we can have all this knowledge, but, you know, where are the, I guess, true and tried measures where you're actually applying this at an MPLW level? Um, you know, what, what's it going to take where we can actually, whether it's within policy or, or it's some, something that we want to actually invest in is to, to protect our developing players because I've done it, my ACL, three times, whether or not I knew whether, where I was in my cycle, but... You know what can we what can we do to avoid um, some of our up and coming stars from being out of the game for you know more than twelve months? So is it something that you know we as a cohort of coaches and working the female game? How do we I guess drive this to a level where we do have some application around um, you know putting this in place that we we can actually track and monitor you know the female menstrual cycle and the effects that it does have on um, in, increasing the risks of injury. I think just in response, Kat, 
Um, I think this is probably, as I said, it's going to be kind of tried and tested. Or, you know, it's going to be trial and error a little bit, but it's definitely something that I'm passionate and do want to work towards. But it, obviously, one person's not going to change the world and one person's not going to be able to make it all happen. But obviously, if I can try and get the, some wheels in motion and, you know, with women and, and coaches like you ladies that are here, if, you know, that's something that we could put our heads together and experiment and kind of come back and, you know, get some results and report back and, that's how we're going to build just like the women's football network started three, four years ago. You know, it starts small and, you know, we're going to have to do our own research. We haven't got the research or the tools and means, like you said, um, available here to us. So we've got to start that and, you know, and I'm sure that there's plenty of people to come on board. You know, I've done a lot of work and still work with a lot of sports scientists and things like that as well. So, you know, I'm sure that a lot of them would jump on board to, to help out the cause anyway hmm. I just want to say like I think it's really important what we're all saying that one of the main issues in football is that uh, there is an issue with the masculinity and femininity, femininity side and with this whole men menstrual cycle uh, conversation I think it's really important that we communicate to the girls appropriately and make sure that they don't feel inferior or weak as a result of hmm. you know their natural you know uh, body cycle um, and how that's communicated to the players, especially from, you know, a male coming to talk to a, a female about that. I think definitely more education and training needs to be done in that area because one of our major issues is that our participation. So women and girls are not wanting to participate. In, like they are, yes, our participation numbers are growing, but, you know, the reality is they're significantly lower than the men. So how can we actually bridge that gap to make football a more like welcoming and inclusive environment for women and girls and <coughs> those conversations around, you know, menstrual cycles and whatnot, because the reality is we just need to make it, I think um, a few of you have touched on this, like more fun, inclusive, welcoming for them. So then they one come to the game, but then stay in the game. Cause one of our huge issues is just that lack Well, one not wanting to participate. And then two, when they do participate, they don't stay in our game. Um, yeah, I mean, this, this discussion could seriously go on all night oh, and yeah. I think we're all so passionate, which is amazing. Um, but just what, um, <laughs> Bianca said, you know, uh, club welfare, um, yeah. I know since, um, employing a club welfare officer at our club, the retention of girls, but not just girls, but uh, players in general, um, has been so much better. I think it's supported players, coaches, parents feel more comfortable, um, and I think, yeah, we really need to look at, yes, we want to identify all these things in supporting players, but as clubs, how do we put structures in place to support everything else? Um, and yeah, club welfare, um, and player welfare and, you know, everyone's welfare is definitely got to be, you know, top of the list somewhere. Mm. Um, yeah, great point. Great point, Ashina. Unless you just said that tonight, I wouldn't have a clue that a welfare officer at your club has increased your ability or your percentage of retention of your players. So if that's something that's working for you, can we share that model? Um, is it more imperative rather than having a technical director looking after 12 to 16 year olds in terms of um, football development, should clubs at NPL level now be mandated to have a welfare officer with some kind of minimal sort of qualification mm. um, that's addressing not only the development, I mean, develop the kids all you want, you can develop them right up to the age of 16, great job technical director, but if we don't have the wel welfare officer there to keep them in the game from 17 and beyond, what's the point of developing them as footballers if they're going to leave the game? I get obviously the benefits of football being school for life, but in terms of keeping players in the game and good players moving on to become W League players and, you know, representing their country, then that might be something that we need to push given our experience within women's football. Is it imperative that given our low retention rates, great that our participation is growing, but like I said earlier, it's that retention rate that I think that's, critical it should be that we're mandated to have some kind of welfare officer within clubs to support male coaches in having some of these difficult conversations mm. is it educating male coaches or any coach female male to to have these difficult conversations? it's something that 
you know, we've worked through at a pro level is that, you know, it's critical to be able to manage some of these difficult conversations to make sure you're addressing the needs of, of your athletes or, your, you know, your players as well. And, you know, we didn't have a rule book on how this club welfare officer role was going to be done. It was literally something that um, when the committee got together, it was something that we saw a gap in. Um, and it very much was week by week, what does this person become involved in? Um, and naturally, over time, it it's probably become one of the most important roles at the club. Um, and we've worked out, you know, how it supports coaches, how it supports players, um, and it's probably something that should have been implemented years ago, but has always, the priority has always been players on the park yep. um, and, and not this, yeah, welfare aspect. Um, and as I said, there's no rule book, there's no right, wrong way of doing it. Um, mm. It's just working out what this person represents and how they can support everyone. In our coaching courses and our coaching content around... Mm. Such a huge em emphasis on the X's and O's, the, the technical ta tactical aspect of the game. But um, as we've already sort of mentioned tonight, there's so much more to the physical uh, and I guess the psychological part of the game where we're going to get players, whether it's retention, uh, performance or just, just enjoyment. We, I guess we need to look at all quadrants of, of what makes up a person. Mm, definitely. definitely. Agree. Um, last point, does anyone want to add something? Anyone would like to add something? No? Oh, good. Good. Uh, just, just quickly on that topic, I think, you know, we're all in agreement about welfare being something and some of us have seen results from having welfare officers. But it, for me, having someone to aid and assist with welfare in a club environment, I think it should be mandated. And that's something, you know, that we should start advocating to the FFA and FFE about um, is definitely that welfare officers, especially in an MPL environment where, you know, you're dealing with a lot more pressures and the, the kids feel a lot more pressures as well as the players. So, you know, that's definitely something that should be advocated and something that I will bring up at the next Women's in Football Network whenever that ends up happening, the next event. But it's definitely something that needs to get raised. And, you know, unless people or people like us start raising raising the question and putting it to them, nothing's ever going to change or it, yeah. you know, it won't be implemented because no one's actually given them that feedback. Yeah. yeah, just on that point, Bianca, you're spot on, but, you know, I'll just go back to, to Ash is that, you know, it might take clubs like from a ground up initiative that clubs take on this, I guess, role of implementing the things that they feel that they need in their environments. And then obviously, the more people know about it and the, the knowledge, the education is spread about, I guess, a blueprint of implementation and, and obviously what can and can't happen and here's maybe some barriers and challenges. Um, I think, and, and I, you know, we're certainly, in the environments that I've worked in, we're so guilty of just having a reliance on Football Victoria or Football Federation Australia to mandate an action or a policy or put something in place when, I guess, the people at the coalface like ourselves really see what the need is um, and I think we should be proactive in, in putting things in place to I guess uh, fix what we can within our own environments and control the controllables and I guess we're not even thinking that there's going to be this magic sort of potion from above that's going to trickle down over the game and fix every problem I think you know as much as we can we need to work within our environments to provide the best experience for our players. No, yeah, I'm just in agreement with everyone. I think it's really important that, yeah, the, you know, we look after the welfare of all our players. It may have to even be from like a volunteer capacity, I think, mm -hmm. as we all know our budgets are quite sparse as, at football clubs. Um, so, yeah, that might just involve like creating that culture where, you know, someone is who is quite, um, you know, capable and confident and wanting to commit to that sort of role puts their hand up and, um, initiates that so yeah I think it's definitely something that would make our game a lot better one uh, we get yep all right so we're back with our final topic of the night and we're going to be looking at what does a post um, COVID-19 look like for the women's game and what do we need to start doing or what do clubs start doing Kat oh okay I'll start <laughs> um 
if I could pass this message on to our current coaches in the panel and then try yep. and, I guess, drop a, drop a pedal in the pond and, and hopefully this ripple sort of gets out to the wider football community, I think it's just so important that there's a measured approach to how we return mm-hmm. uh, to, to playing. So return to play. And it'll be no different to, I guess, maybe some of the policies and the procedures you have in returning an athlete after injury is that yeah. we've had such a, I guess, a, a massive decrease or... A, even a, a complete stop of high explosive movements of our athletes that if we're expecting them to come back in at a level they left us or to, to be coming in somewhere ready to play football, we're kidding ourselves and uh, it'll just be an injustice if we try and expect our players to do certain things with this, I guess, mindset of we need to try and catch up the time we've missed. Um, I think it's imperative that the, the federation... Um, put, I guess, something within the structures or its return to play or the, the season formats to take this into consideration about how we return to football safely. Yeah. Bianca? Yeah, so I, I tend to agree with Kath. I think that it's important, um, you know, we, that we have the right measures to come back and do light training, pre-season training before we get back into starting games because otherwise we're going to end up with a lot of injuries across the board from youth right through to seniors and mm. it'll just cause all the problems. I think it is important though that we do have a 2020 season. Um, yeah. Or be, I, I, I don't know what that would look like, whether it's a delayed season or a modified season, a shorter season, but I, I think it's important for the girls and, and you know, even for us as coaches, I'm sure we're all, we're all missing football and being a part of football and all of that kind of stuff. Mm. Uh, yeah, I think, um, I think we have some challenges when we do um, enter, like when we start playing football and one of them is going to be the cost. Yeah. Um, just knowing from my, you know, currently I know a lot of senior women that, you know, have lost their jobs uh, don't have money, so the cost of football to play, participate, is definitely going to contribute. Yep. Um, I also think, you know, the role of, like, a welfare officer or just, um, I guess, looking after the welfare of all players in the club is going to be really important as, yes. um, you know, the longer this um, COVID, um, like, you know, prolongs, it just means less contact. That can increase anxiety uh, mm-hmm. of a lot of players coming into a team environment, a social environment. So anything a club can do to address that, I think we'll definitely ease in that uh, transition and getting all the players back and resuming competition. Yeah, I completely agree with Bianca. There has to be some sort of season. Yeah. Um, Every single person would have gone through this COVID experience differently, um, Mm. whether they've been isolated on their own, whether they've been with family and friends, whether they've had access um, to do any sport and fitness, um, how they've managed, whether they have their job, um, so from a club point of view, we just have to make sure we are doing everything we can to support these people um, because the mental health of everyone is key um, yeah. and it will flow on to next season and the season after. And we don't want COVID to ruin our sport. Um, no. We want to bounce back, but we want to bounce back the right way. And I think that's why it's important we talk to council and we get their support. The federation needs to do as much as they can to support clubs, whether that be help us making it more cost-effective yeah, because I certainly don't want to turn around to a family and say you can't play um, because they can't afford their fees yeah. um, because they've lost both their jobs. But we yeah. also know it costs to play football. Um, so from yeah, uh, from a club perspective, it's just making sure we understand how everyone's kind of survived this. Yep. Um, how it's impacted them as a person and how our sport can support them um, and I guess bounce back from this. Mm-hmm. Definitely. And Sam? You know, there's so many factors to think about and everybody's covered everything. You know, if I can reiterate, they've got, um, there's cost, um, yep. there's mental health, there's that 1.5 metre social distancing thing that people are going to keep in the back of their mind. You know, there's a season, um, there's injuries, there's, um, we, we didn't finish pre-season. So what do we call it? 1.2 pre-season? Do we have four weeks extra to train and then go into it? Because it's injuries. The, you know, we can't just go in from where we stop and go straight into season. We can't just do that. 
You know, mm. we've got, we have to look after all our players, juniors, seniors, male, female, the masters of, you know, even soccer moms. You know, they just can't jump in and start playing because those women, they're hardcore footballers as soccer moms. You know, I should know because <laughs> I coach them. You know, they're full on. And they even <laughs> take on the children. I mean, come on. So you kind of understand that um, I love your comment, Ash. I love your comment, Bianca and, and Ash and Kat. Absolutely spot on. What do we do? How do we tackle this? And I think with us intelligent ladies and real hit. I reckon we can come up with some sort of program that I'm pretty sure we can filter out to the clubs and say, look, this should, we should do this. Mm. And we should understand that it's just not, um, we can't just pick up. Yeah, you know, hey, we stopped and we're coming back in again. Let's go play. We can't do that. Mm. No. No, it just, yeah, we got to look after our players. It, yeah, it wasn't just football that stopped. The whole world pretty the much whole world. stopped. Exactly, yeah. So how do we, in some sense, get our community back? Yeah. How do we get that communication back? Yes, we don't want anyone getting injured, but we also know how important it is to come back. So whether, you know, it's mandated as across all clubs that this is how we do it or it's down to each club get knowing their members and going, this is what's going to work. Um, in whatever capacity it is, we have to come back. I'm just heading over to Margo. Just... Yeah, well, it's... I won't be able to uh, say anything more than what you said, guys. <laughs> I think that was uh, <laughs> most everything. Uh, from a um, technical perspective, I would say that we still don't know how it's going to be uh, in a health, health perspective, I, want, uh, I wanted to say. Um, um, how are we going to be able to play? I guess in Australia, the situation is not that bad. I'm always following uh, European news and it, it's 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 a bit more complicated over there, but even here, like how football is going to be, even if we play this season, how it's going to be, how we not going to be able to defend. Well, I'm going to be quite happy if I don't have to. Um, <laughs> but what I mean is we don't know what it's going to look like. And, and it's hard to, to, to plan uh, yeah. things from a technical perspective. No, it definitely yeah. is. Let's just go around. Um, so just looking at it as terms of long term and short term. So what about long term? Do we like what are your thoughts over there? Like do you think things will just return back to the way it was in twelve months time? Or um, I think that it has the potential to, but I also think we have to be really smart about um, if this ever happened again, how does it affect us less? Um, yes, Mike. <laughs> um, so Yes, she can have it. Off you go. Um, so, yeah, so how do we as clubs, so how do we exist if this ever happens again? How do mm. we, you know, operate offline? How do, how do we still keep out, you know, interactive with our members? How do we still run sessions online? I think we all got caught out by this. Oh, yes. I think um, none of us thought our clubs would ever be shut down for any reason. Mm -hmm. um, and long term, how do we better ourselves? So yes, short term we want everyone back, but long term, how do we become better clubs? Yeah, definitely. Um, Kat, go go. Yes. Yeah, I guess uh, a lot of the talk at the moment is an opportunity to really reset football. Um, yeah. I think we are very good at, I guess, conforming back to what is normal. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess. My apprehension, or even call it a fear, is that we will just return back to what we did because that's yeah. our default. We do things because that's how it was always mm -hmm. done. Um, so that's why I'm very pro towards this this reset of football and, and welcome the news that they've now got a, I guess, a starting eleven. They're calling it a, a panel in which um, involves former. Uh, coaches and uh, national representatives across the soccerers and the Matildas um, devising a panel which, which will be a voice, I guess, in their collective experience, maybe uh, pointing the game in the right direction because although I think COVID-19 is really, I guess, uh, putting a magnifying glass on some of the issues that were already existing within our game, like the cost yeah. to families and players, um, the environments in which whether they are inclusive enough for females to have a positive experience and stay in the game. Mm -hmm. These all existed before a virus. Um, so now it's just an opportunity to really reset, I guess, uh, and have a look at what our North Star really is. Um, yeah. And tackle, uh, I guess, putting football 
First, I think it's a call from CEO James Johnson in regards to what some of our priorities are to, for the good of the game, uh, rather than, I guess, the aspect of commercialisation and, and those in it for, I guess, different reasons other than the game itself. Mm.